Hello, and thanks so much for choosing to listen to this mini episode of Love Your Library, the Hampshire Libraries podcast. I'm your host, Mary Stone. And thank you to our supporter, BorrowBox, our library app that lets you download ebooks and audiobooks to your phone or tablet. Details about how to access it are on our website. You just need your library membership number and PIN. Now, it always gives me great pleasure to introduce you to different writers and share their stories about what influences them and how they got where they are today. It's especially exciting when it's local talent, and that's the case in this episode. Coming up in a moment is my interview with novelist Judith Hennigan, who grew up here in Hampshire. According to her website, Judith read history at the University of York and spent many years working as a commissioning editor. She's well-travelled, which she draws on in her work, as you'll hear later, and spent time in Kiev, Moscow and Islamabad before she settled in Winchester with her four children. She has a doctorate in creative arts, has written extensively for young people and lectures in creative writing. Her first novel for adults is called Schnegerwojtka. <laughs> That's a title I had to practice a little before this episode. Okay, so here's the synopsis from the publisher's website. The publisher is Salt. Kiev, 1992. Rachel, a troubled young English mother, joins her journalist husband on his first foreign posting in the city. Terrified of the apartment's balcony, she develops obsessive rituals to keep their baby safe. Her difficulties expose her to a disturbing endgame between the elderly caretaker and a local racketeer who sends her a gift that surely comes with a price. Rachel is isolated yet culpable with her secrets and estrangements. As consequences bear down, she seeks out Zoya, her husband's fixer, and the boy from upstairs who watches them all. I recently had the pleasure of talking with Judith over the phone, of course, about what influenced her to write this book and what's behind that amazing title. The interview begins with Judith reading a short excerpt from the novel. By the time Rachel returns to Staranavodnitska Street, Ivan is howling. He's thirsty and his nappy is bloated and sagging inside his snowsuit. She prays that the lift is working that she won't have to climb the stairs. Her need to count the depleting pile of pampers beneath her bed is making her heart race. She navigates the double doors of the entrance by pushing backwards with her hip and rocking the buggy wheels over the metal grate. As they rattle into the foyer, she remembers she's forgotten to knock the snow off the wheels. Clumps of blackened ice drop in her wake as she hurries across the floor. She'll have to be quick so that the caretaker won't catch her. Ivan's wails echo around the walls, but the lift is ahead of her now, yawning open, its interior empty like the vertical box that the magician's assistant climbs into before the door is locked and trick swords are thrust through its sides. It's all right, she thinks, we'll make it. Then, as she approaches, the toneless bell pings and a weak light glows above her head. Someone on the ninth floor has just called the lift, so she shunts the pushchair quickly over the threshold. This is a mistake. The scuffed brown doors make a grinding noise and judder towards each other. Before she can pull back, they clamp against the metal frame. The pushchair is trapped. Rachel tugs so hard that an onion from the string dangling down from the handle breaks off and rolls out into the middle of the foyer. She stabs at the buttons on the control panel as her mind floods with visions of her son's head crushed beneath the lintel as the lift starts to rise. Then, sense kicks in and she stoops forward, releases the straps and lifts Ivan out of his seat. Holding him against her shoulder, she yanks again at the pushchair. The frame is stuck tight. Ivan's feet scrabble for a purchase beneath her ribs. Perhaps she should simply abandon the pushchair and take the stairs. But what if someone else removes the pushchair? She can't manage without it. There's only one thing to do. She'll have to find the caretaker. The caretaker, Teddy, called her something, Baba Yaga. Well, Rachel doesn't believe in witches, though the old woman clearly sees herself as some kind of spy. In the old days, she thinks, the caretaker must have been paid to listen and watch and poke through the rubbish. If you spoke against the party, she'd have heard it. If you hoarded fuel, she'd have smelled it, and if you took a lover, well, she'd have sniffed that out too. Now, Lucas says, no one is rewarded for whispering any more. 
But what if other people's business is all you know and searching out weakness is what makes you feel strong? That old woman, she sits in her little hidey hole across the foyer and purses her lips whenever Rachel walks by, wagging her finger like a stick to beat the bad wife who dares to leave her flat and flaunt her baby as if she's proud of him, proud of what she's produced. They're everywhere, these crones, barren with secrets, berating her on the trolley bus or in the bread shop or murmuring and crossing themselves outside the cathedrals and the churches, tugging at her hair when she doesn't cover her head and kicking the pushchair when she wheels it across the painted floor to show Ivan the candles at the back of those dark, cloying shrines. Ivan has stopped crying. The only sound is her breathing, shallow and rapid. Rachel turns towards the caretaker's cubicle. It has a glass front. A curtain strung on a length of drooping wire is drawn across the window. Allô? she calls, her own voice unfamiliar in the empty, echoing space. Uh, Dobre tien? There's no reply. Shifting Ivan round to her hip, her forearm slotted under his shoulder, she walks over to the cubicle. The door is partly open. She steps closer, sees a chair with a worn, flattened cushion. It appears empty. All the same, she thinks she must knock, so she taps her fingers lightly on the glass. At her touch, the door swings wide, and now she can see further inside a cheap desk, a black telephone and some yellowing notices stuck to the window frame and pinned along the back wall. The smell from Ivan's nappy is sharp and sour. Rachel knows she needs to get him upstairs, that the ammonia that's forming will burn into his flesh. She ought to abandon the pushchair or exit the building and go outside to the steps that she thinks must lead down to the basement. But instead she's distracted by the brown and white patterned teacup and saucer placed to one side of a stained ink blotter. Above the teacup hangs a calendar with an image of a teenage girl in folk dress, and there, pushed into a corner, lies a small pink plastic hairbrush with its nest of grey hairs. The muteness of these objects repels and moves her and she holds herself in for several seconds or even a minute until, finally, her eyes register something else. On the shelf behind the chair is a slim cardboard carton, rectangular, dark green, a little crushed. The gold clock is still visible on the side. A box of after eights. Her box, the one she threw down the rubbish chute. Carefully she lies Ivan down on his back across the desk and stretches over the chair to reach it. She raises the dented lid, runs her forefinger across the waxy sleeves. There's no folded slip of paper, no hidden note. Just a soft rustle like shifting sand and a fusty smell that mingles with a trace of peppermint. Sto! The harsh voice behind her makes Rachel jump. In the same moment she sees two arthritic hands in fingerless gloves reaching forward. The hands pick up her son, who grabs hold of the teacup, and when Rachel turns round, the caretaker is clutching Ivan to her chest, and Ivan is opening his mouth to ball, so she lets go of the box, and all three of them look down to where dark squares are fluttering, and thousands upon thousands of tiny black seeds are spilling and spinning across the cold floor. Rachel needs her baby back, but the old woman is holding him tight. Her wrinkled face is no longer a mesh of disapproval. Instead, her mouth is open and her eyes are aghast. Something terrible is happening here. Something terrible has already happened. Thank you so much. That was really lovely. First, can you tell me the name of your book and describe what it is all about for our listeners? Yeah, so the title of the book is Snegorochka. And for anyone who doesn't know, Snegorochka is a Russian fairy tale, a fairy tale character who was originally the daughter of Grandfather Frost. But these days, she's everywhere at New Year in parts of the former Soviet Union, really as well known as our Father Christmas, uh, dispensing presents dressed in a long blue and white frock. And so, um, she, you know, her origins are in a fairy tale, but she's she's changed and evolved over the years. And, and that kind of means something in, in terms of the book. Snegorochka is about a young English mother who, she takes her new baby to Kiev in the autumn of 1992, which is shortly after Ukraine declared independence. She's alienated from her husband, possibly suffering from some sort of postnatal depression, but she's certainly terrified of the balcony of the apartment where they live, which is on the 13th floor. 
she encounters a city that seems very closed in on itself, very brittle and frightening. She doesn't speak Ukrainian or Russian. She can't communicate with anybody. So she spends a lot of time to begin with walking the streets with her baby in the buggy, shopping really, looking for nappies, trying to find fresh fruit, bread, all of those um, basic necessities. And in so doing, she encounters and forges some unlikely relationships, really, with four characters in particular. There's Elena, who is the caretaker for her block of flats. Zoya, who is her husband's translator and fixer. Stepan, who's a a 13-year-old boy who lives in the flat above. And Mikola, who is a sort of petty gangster, really. And as she encounters these four characters, and as she learns to be a mother as well, she sees that these four characters are all connected to each other and to her in ways that she could never have guessed. A lot of the novel is sort of exploring those connections and unraveling them. As she moves through this extraordinary city, Kiev is the most beautiful and extraordinary place, really, particularly back then in the early 90s, directly after independence from the Soviet Union. Why did you feel that the need to write about this particular place? I did used to live there. And um, in in many ways, there are some very direct parallels. I uh, took my own baby out and to Kiev in 1992. And my character, Rachel, lives really in the flat that I and my husband uh, lived in at the time. But that is where the parallels end. Rachel is not me and all of the characters are invented. But what I found was that while I was there, I didn't speak the language either. And I did spend a lot of time walking the streets looking for basic goods. And I got to know the city in a way that I felt uh, my husband, who was a journalist, wasn't. We encountered the city in very, very different ways. He was working. He could speak Russian, Ukrainian. And I was just, you know, wandering around, really, trying to do some very basic things with a baby. And, and I heard stories and I saw things, lots of things I didn't understand that just made me wonder about this place, about the lives of the people that I couldn't communicate with. But, you know, you'd sit on a trolley bus and there'd be a row of faces sitting opposite me. And people at the time, I think a lot of people have experienced this, a lot of foreigners who've traveled through the former Soviet Union at that time, people were very closed initially. They didn't smile or talk to you in shops or on buses. And in fact, could seem outwardly very stern. I was sort of scolded a lot. I mean, I didn't need to understand the language to know that I was being scolded by people who obviously felt that I was bringing up my baby in the wrong way, or I shouldn't be where I was, or whatever. whatever. And, and I've just found myself thinking, what is behind this? What have these people seen? What have they lived? Uh, you know, back then, people would have seen, they would have lived through the famine in the 1920s, the purges in the 30s, of course, the Second World War, and everything since. And I just... So you'd see an old old woman sitting on a trolley bus and I would just think, what what do you know? What have you lived? And that, of course, is a gift for a novelist. You just start imagining. In this, in this exquisite setting, you know, Kiev, yes, it's a former Soviet city. It has a lot of those characteristics, cold, grey in the winter, certainly. Some of the architecture isn't very appealing, but some of it is just exquisite. It is a green city full of trees, full of the most beautiful churches, wide boulevards, some of them still cobbled. It's a fabulous place. I think it's fascinating the way you've used this location, this place with its rich political, social history to explore a very common theme of motherhood. Lots of people can experience motherhood, even if they don't actually give birth to a child. Several of the characters in the book might in some respects be called a mother, even though, as I say, they may not have children of their own. And the whole of Kiev and where the novel is set, is dominated by this extraordinary giant uh, steel statue, which is called the Motherland statue. And it's very difficult to avoid, really. And so there were all of these thoughts uh, going through my head. And then I also felt that as a mother, as I say, sort of mute, really, because I couldn't speak the language. Um, And with a young baby, so you've got all of those very basic needs and you know, nurturing that baby is really all you have time for and all you can think about. And so how does a woman like 
that or a person like that encounter an environment that feels hostile initially? And what do they see in a way that no one else sees? What does what does a, a new mother see that no one else sees? Often people talk about new motherhood being a time when, oh, you know, my brain is really fuzzy or, you know, people come out with these things or, you know, oh, it's and it is an extraordinary time. But that perspective is also really, really unique, not just looking inward on oneself and, you know, looking after a baby, but that perspective, that place of being a new mother, how does that affect how you view, how you look outwards and how you see the world? I kind of wanted to say this isn't just domestic, you know, domestic actually has is political as well. And the personal is political as well. You know, I really resist that sort of sense of motherhood being something that is only for people who are having that experience. Yeah, I really want other mothers to be able to relate to it and and find something in it. But I wanted to make that experience wider for people who've never, you know, who don't know what that's like as well. This is your first novel, but you actually started out as a children's writer, is that right? I suppose I began my career with books really as an editor and worked on quite a few children's nonfiction books. And then um, I lived abroad a lot. We were in Russia for a while, came back from Russia. By that time, I had four small children and I was starting to think, I really do want to write. And I applied to my local university to take an MA in creative writing. And the only MA that they ran at the time was an MA in writing for children. So that's what I did. Um, And that really was my entry into writing. I I got a children's novel published out of that. And then I started writing a lot of nonfiction for children. It was real bread and butter work. You know, I've written a lot of books for nonfiction books for children to earn a living. And and then I started teaching creative writing. And this story about Kiev, uh, wanting to write about Kiev, had never really gone away. I knew as soon as I left Kiev that I wanted to write something about it. But I just didn't know what was it. it didn't I didn't feel like I wanted to write autobiography or a memoir. I didn't think I could anyway. I mean, I'm, I find it too easy to make things up. And so I started writing and, and it, Negorotchka took me a long time to write uh, because I was teaching and I had small children. But I also went along to a local writers group, the Hyde Writers in Winchester, and started just reading little snippets out just to sort of, you know, have that kind of sense of a bit of support and a bit of feedback. I was very nervous about it, even though I've taught creative writing for many years, I was still very nervous taking some of my own medicine. <laughs> and um, But they were hugely encouraging. And and I, I started to gain in confidence in terms of wanting to, to, to engage this audience of my writing group every you know, every month. It was a great place to try out some of the new work, really. Just a final question now. It's one we often ask, and that's about libraries and how you use libraries. And I wondered if you used them for any research, not just for this book, but any previous books. They are fantastic places for inspiration, I find, you know, just browsing as well, just physically going and, you know, looking at a section. It's even better than searching on the Internet because, <laughs> you know, you can hold the book in your hands. And uh, and, and I'm, I'm always surprised by what I find. I will always go into a library and end up sitting down with a book that I hadn't expected to find. Um, so I'm very easily distracted in that way. But what fabulous resources they are. You know, when I was a child, yes, we had books in the house, but they weren't books that I wanted to read. And I was lucky enough to have parents who took me to the library every Saturday. And that those few minutes of being able to browse and choose whatever you wanted without anyone guiding you or telling you, browsing, not knowing what I was going to find, pulling out a book, wondering what it would be, you know, just being able to sit on the floor and, and think, is this the one for me? So I'm a massive fan of libraries, hugely grateful to them. That was my interview with Hampshire writer Judith Hennigan discussing her debut novel, Schnegerreutschka. Thank you for listening to Love Your Library, the Hampshire Libraries podcast. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to hear more interviews like this, plus book recommendations from our expert library staff in our longer episodes. And thanks once again to our supporter, Borrowbox. You'll find all the details for downloading their library app on our website. Please do get in touch and tell us what you think of the books and authors we've talked about. And it would be great if you'd rate and review our podcast on iTunes, as this helps other people to find us.
I'm Mary Stone, and you've been listening to the Love Your Library mini podcast. <laughs>